So welcome to our webinar, Expanding Digital Access Through Affordable Connectivity Program. And if you're just joining us, please access the toolkit link for schools um, in the chat, and it'll be our main resource for today. And I'm going to go ahead and just in case, if you just joined us, I'm going to go ahead and drop that link one more time for you. And my name is Jane Miller, and I'm the Project Director of District Leader and IT and C-Suite Experiences for the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools initiative here at Digital Promise, and I'm excited to have you all here with us today, and we're going to discuss that affordable connectivity program. And to get us started, as you're taking a look there at that toolkit that I dropped as well and getting that download link set for yourselves, I want us to take care of a few housekeeping items. So to get us started, let's find out who's in the room. So first, uh, go ahead and share your name, your location, and your school district in the chat so that we know who's here with us today. We want to make sure and customize this to meet your needs. So again, who's in the room? Name, location, and school district. I see some familiar names out there, so it'll be nice to hear from you as well. All right. Fantastic. I see names coming in here. Roselia Public Schools. Right. And as you're doing that, and hey, Michael there, San Francisco Unified. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Got New Jersey in the house. We are coast to coast, California, all the way back east. We got Ohio. Excellent, too. All right. Thank you so much for being here with us. And as you're doing right now, you're going to have the opportunity to use that chat at any time. You have questions. Um, they, you know, they might be questions in the moment that I'm able to bring forth to our wonderful presenter that we're going to have today. Otherwise, we are going to have a Q&A at the end as well. So all questions are fair game. We want to make sure that this meets your needs. And so you're going to use that chat there as well as the Q&A tab. So you're going to see me moving in between both of those to make sure we meet your needs today. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I see a few more folks who have uh, joined us. So thank you so much. And again, I'm going to go ahead and drop that link in the chat for the toolkit. But we have our guest today. Panelist is Marcella Ingman. She's a manager of community engagement with the Education Super Highway. So really excited to have her with us today and glad to introduce her. She's passionate about leveling the playing field for underserved students. And she's here to talk to you today about the affordable connectivity program and how your district can be eligible with your families to get them connected to affordable home internet. What is it? Well, how does it work? And how can you get started? So that's what it's all about today. So Marcella, you're gonna take it away. I'm gonna go ahead and come off uh, camera there and hand it on over to you. So go ahead and bring your camera up. Thank you so much, Jane. Let me pull this up. All righty. And again, for those of you who, who joined us, thanks so much. We have a, others coming on board. I'm putting that link there in the chat for you. And go ahead and download that toolkit. All righty. Now are we on? Can everyone see my screen OK? Absolutely. And if you'd like to come on camera, you can as yes, well, too. I will. Let's see. Where is my camera? All right, I'm going to ask you to start your video. Did that work? Thank you. That's perfect. All right. <laughs> all righty. So thank you all uh, for being here. I'm excited to talk to you all today. Um, and thank you, uh, Jane, for having me here today. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the Affordable Connectivity Program and what an awareness campaign could look like uh, for from a school district perspective. I will first introduce what we refer to as the broadband affordability gap, uh, cover in basic form what the affordable connectivity program is. Uh, I will share with you a little bit more about the school district ACP toolkit for which you now have the link. Um, it has many resources and guides for how to effectively reach households within your districts and promote the program. Um, I'll also introduce you to a pretty cool tool that was developed uh, it's called, we call it the getacp.org pre-enrollment tool, um, and it was written and designed to make it easy for households to know if they qualify for the program. 
And finally, I will share with you a short case study based on the work that we did with Worcester Public Schools in Massachusetts. And as Jane said, we'll of course save some time for questions at the end. So just to give you a little bit of background on um, who we are at Education Superhighway, um, Education Superhighway has a long history of working with school districts and departments of education. The original mission of the organization was to close the connectivity gap in classrooms across the country. When the organization was launched back in 2013, there were close to 23,000 schools without fiber in their classrooms, and only about 10% of students could access digital learning. By 2020, 93.3% of schools were connected to fiber, increasing digital learning access to 99.6% of students. And this all was done uh, by leveraging the E-Rate program and working very closely with different departments of education across the country. Having achieved um, the mission, Education Superhighway was actually ready to shut its doors in 2020. And now here comes the phrase that we've heard a little too much over the last couple of years, and then COVID hit. Um, as students moved into remote learning, a new challenge became very evident. Uh, very quickly, uh, school districts realized that the connectivity gap had not only existed at schools, but also at homes. So many of our existing partners reached out to see if Education Superhighway could help overcome this challenge. So I will talk a little bit now about this broadband affordability gap. This chart is, uh, it's got many layers, but um, just want to call your attention to those 20.8 million unconnected households across the country. There are different reasons for why people are unconnected. However, uh, we are excited to continue our work to focus on closing the digital divide for the 18 million households that have access to internet but simply cannot connect because they cannot afford a subscription. Um, that is what we call the broadband affordability gap. We are focusing on America's most unconnected communities where we can empower and equip trusted local messengers such as yourselves. Uh, to spread awareness and to help facilitate enrollment in the program. Uh, so together, we have a historic opportunity to help bring access to those 18 million households and bridge the, uh, the broadband affordability gap by taking advantage of a new federal benefit. We know that the past couple of years have been incredibly challenging for education departments and school communities, and that many of these difficulties and understaffing issues might continue. So as an organization, we have focused on developing resources to ease the burden on, burden on awareness and enrollment partners to spread the word and provide support to the extent that they are able. Uh, we are a national nonprofit and our tools and toolkits and work are provided at no cost to anybody who wishes to engage. So let's talk a little bit about that benefit. So as, COVID, uh, as a COVID response, the federal government um, put in place what you might have heard previously referred to as EBB, the Emergency Broadband Benefit. Um, however, it became evident that the affordability gap was real for a lot of Americans and as such, EBB transitioned into a more long-term benefit, now known as the Affordable Connectivity Program. This program is a $14.2 billion program to help Americans um, who cannot afford the cost of home broadband. It's estimated that approximately 16.6 .6 million households are eligible for this benefit. So what it is, is an eligible household is eligible to receive $30 a month for broadband service. Now this benefit is not given directly to the household. It's given to the internet service provider that they choose to enroll with uh, to provide the, the service. There is also a one-time discount of $100 towards the purchase of a connected device. Um, and we are struggling to find uh, the major ISPs who are providing this discount. However, it does exist um, and there is definitely uh, some advocacy that could go on for bigger um, internet service providers to uh, provide the device, the device um, benefit as well. So just to touch on um, eligibility, 
A house is eligible if the total income of that household is at or below the 200%, 200% of the federal poverty level, or if at least one member of the household is enrolled in a benefit program such as SNAP, uh, Medicaid, public housing assistance, SSI, WIC, or Lifeline. A household can also uh, be eligible if they have a student who attends a CEP school or is enrolled in the free or reduced, reduced lunch program. And also if they have a student who receives a Pell Grant for that academic year. One great thing is uh, that depending on the location, households have now a greater choice in which ISP to select. We have seen that for the most part, all ISPs have plans that become free with benefit with the um, affordable kind of connectivity program benefit. Uh, families can choose which provider to go to, and this is not the case. This was not the case for the EBB or any sponsored services. So enrolling in the program is a multi-step process. Um, the, the two major steps I want to highlight is that um, a family needs to apply um, for the benefit. And then after they are qualified um, and enrolled, they have to then call the service provider to make sure that they apply their code to a plan. So um, there, there's some assistance that can be provided it, during the enrollment application process, but um, for the most part, those are the two uh, major uh, points. So despite the uh, available funds, program adoption has been quite slow to take off. Um, we attribute this to three major factors. The first one, of course, general awareness. Unfortunately, only about 25% of eligible households are aware of the program. Uh, there's confusion about the benefits, whether or not it's going to last uh, long enough. Um, and so um, people just don't know in general terms about the program or what it offers. The other one is trust. Um, it is challenging to have families sign up for, for federal programs. Um, and we will talk about some resources that Education Superhighway can provide to help address this. School districts are well placed to address these barriers to meet uh, the goal of creating a more equitable internet access and increasing learning opportunities for all students and the wraparound benefits for the households having internet access. So as trusted entities, School districts have strong communication channels to spread awareness of the benefit to these families. School districts can address concerns, answer questions, and ensure that they can reach the families who need this resource the most. Um, the third roadblock uh, to receiving the benefit is enrollment. Uh, there is documentation that uh, is required to prove eligibility. Um, and some language barriers. Um, school districts actually have the authority to provide eligibility documents for families to enroll if needed, and can therefore help eliminate one of the key barriers to enrollment, so that, the, that documentation piece. So to overcome these barriers, we have created um, a toolkit. I hope that you were able to download it. This is how you can get started. Um, one main goal of the toolkit is to provide you with self-serve plug and play materials and guides to make a real impact in, do, in your digital equity work with a lighter lift. Um, Education Superhighways toolkit for, ed, for school districts contains action plans and customizable resources to help you raise awareness of ACP We've included templates, tools, resources to support school districts of all sizes. Uh, there are options there for those to, who are interested in launching a, a um, outreach campaign to families and options for those with the capacity to support enrollment. So if I can call your attention, um, I hope you were able to download the toolkit. Um, on page three, we have let me pull it up myself just so that we can look at it real quick. Um, so this list is pretty much just, you know, the action steps needed to spread awareness. We have listed and linked 
many of the resources that we offer, uh, which you can disseminate to your communities. Uh, we have highlighted some best practices. Um, the links re, uh, will direct you um, directly, will direct you to our resource hub. Um, all these resources are downloadable and editable to a certain extent. And they are all um, free for you to use. The ACP Resource Hub breaks down what the program is, addresses common questions and concerns, et cetera. Uh, the Resource Hub includes a social media toolkit with sample posts and images, as well as other materials like mailers, newsletter blurbs, event postcards, sidewalk signs, flyers, you name it. Um, we have been very uh, intentional about creating resources that can be uh, accessible to different populations. Um, so it's all there. Um, again, all these resources are free of charge. We acknowledge that the internal capacity might not be sufficient to provide enrollment support, but raising awareness and empowering families to apply on their own accomplishes quite a lot. Um, so I just want to give you a quick look into the hub. Um, we have actually um, created resources specific for uh, school districts, and all you have to do is select an option, um, add it to your cart. I can uh, quickly walk you through. For example, if you want to download the social media toolkit, um, you will be prompted if this loads. There we go. Um, you can add um, materials to card. You can uh, view your card and you will be able to proceed to download. So they are very accessible. You can download um, materials in different languages, et cetera. Um, if you look at page five of the toolkit, you'll see the link to our pre-enrollment tool as well. Um, and there is also a, a full guide that families can use to walk themselves through the application. The enrollment guide is super helpful because it comes with screenshots, which also provide good guidance um, as to how to apply. Ready. The links to the hub and the enrollment guide um, uh, should be now in the chat um, and you can feel free to look through those. The hub also includes a CEP and free or reduced lunch template letters so you can provide to families if you have the capacity, um, if that is the only method they can apply. Families can use an eligibility letter from the school um, if you already provide one, um, but no matter what, the letter is the letter used must contain the student's full name, school name, uh, school address, um, the current school year, and a contact, a uh, point of contact for that school. So, um, you know, I just wanted to provide this as a reference if you um, will choose to engage in providing this resource for your families. Now let's take a quick look at that pre-enrollment tool. Um, it's actually a very uh, mobile friendly website. It's not an app that people have to download. It is equipped with a chat feature, which has live support. Um, we have um, staff who speaks English and Spanish um, as enrollment specialists, and they are able to prepare and assist user, users to sign up for ACP. Um, the tool helps guide applicants to identify the most straightforward path to apply, reducing application time from as much as 45 minutes to 15 minutes. Um, the tool also provides a checklist of the documentation that they will need in order to apply. And finally, um, depending on the area, the tool also provides a list of internet service providers um, that, can, that they can sign up through. Uh, we have created a unique link for you to share with families you serve um, if you want to use it. Uh, through this, we will be able to see how many household, households are engaged in your community, 
Um, I want to make sure that you know we are not tracking individual users or collecting their data. We simply are able to see how they interact with the tool, how many go straight to the application after completing that little um, quiz. And then if people are interested in how um, to see how this tool works, I'm more than happy to demo it. Um, and since we have some California people and I am originally from California, I will share that with you in a minute. Uh, let's see. So this is what it looks like. Um, pretty much all you have to do is select a language and then um, put in just a few pieces of information. I'm from the Central Valley, so I will put my good old address. Six. Let's see what comes up. Um, so pretty much, you know, the, the user puts in their zip code and then selects, goes through this list and selects which programs they are already enrolled in. For example, if a family is already receiving SNAP benefits, um, we know that it, that is a direct way to qualify. Um, then they can choose which method of identification they want to use. Um, the quickest way to apply is by using the social security number. However, we acknowledge that some families won't be able to use that. So there are other options, including um, some foreign passports, for example, or, or other government issued IDs. But assuming I have a driver's license, then I can just check my um, checklist, get my checklist. Um, this is a question that we have put in for us to know if the people who are using the tool are already um, receiving internet access in their homes or if they are new users. So assuming, you know, it does nothing with the, with the checklist, but it does let us know that piece of information. So um, the person who used the tool will get, you know, the checklist saying you will need the driver's license, your SNAP card or the SNAP award letter, an email address to sign up online. And then at the bottom, they do receive the list of different plans that are free or um, that some that people will have to contribute to after the benefit. Um, they have the option of saving the page, emailing the checklist, and pro providing a brief survey if they want to do that. So let's look at how one school district approached this work and the results they achieved. First of all, I would like to acknowledge that the resources that have been created here uh, were heavily informed by partners we have worked with. Our partnership with Worcester and Springfield School Districts in Western Massachusetts was extremely influential in developing every piece um, in, the, in the school district toolkit that is now available to you. Um, their work was critical uh, for us to get to the understanding we have today. So uh, this is how they approached their campaign. To start with, they focused on general awareness and um, because they knew that every family they served qualify through their dependent, given the fact that they were a CEP district, they started getting those CEP letters ready. Um, the second approach was to conduct direct, um, direct uh, contact and targeted outreach to families via calls, text messages, emails, um, all with the goal of informing families about the program. Um, third, they reached out to local organizations to support their awareness campaign by posting on their own websites or sharing awareness materials about the program. While we directly supported the district during their campaign by helping with project planning and data tracking, they were the ones taking the lead on awareness. Their familiarity with the community context and the element of trust made their community, the communications effective and uh, significant among their families. They heavily emphasized that awareness was the most important and critical component to build trust in the program and empower family, families to apply on their own. Some of the highlights of the campaign were identified that were identified um, were the best methods of communication and the major roadblocks for families and school administrators uh, to overcome. So for the CEP letters, for example, it was very difficult to match the timing of incoming separate translations, mail mergings, uh, a current data pool of addresses with a deadline. 
Uh, they also tried cold calling and quickly realized that it was not working. Um, first of all, it was too time consuming and did not have the desired effect. So they moved to, te to mass text messaging, which people engage with um, a lot more effectively. One thing to mention is that we also know now that there is a recertification process that takes place after a year of receiving the benefit. So while qualifying through a dependent is great and gives people the ability to enroll, um, it is a lot more efficient to identify an alternate method if possible, um, as it would make that recertification process a lot smoother. So what was the impact of their work? Um, before the campaign kicked off in January 2022, Wester's adoption rate was 26%, um, and 11,000 households were enrolled in the program. As of December 10th, um, the city adoption rate is 49%, and is actually one of the highest in the state and well above the national average of 25%. At this point, 20,645 households are enrolled in the ACP in that city. These are Worcester's recommendations. I will not read through them because at the end of the day, you know your community best and how to communicate with them. You know what your internal capacity is and what level of support you can provide. And at this point, most, uh, most if not all of their resources have been translated into many different languages thanks to the work that they did. Uh, and so it makes it a lot easier for you to share information. And so now that you know about this benefit, there, benefit, there are a few steps that you can take. Uh, the first, of course, is to get the word out, spread awareness about the program through your many communication channels, um, direct families to the getacp.org website to help them determine the easiest way for them to apply. Um, and if needed, and you, you have the capacity, uh, provide families with identification and eligibility documents that they need to apply. Uh, please know that as you embark in this work, um, Education Superhighway is here to support, and I will be more than happy to, um, you know, talk to you if you have any questions uh, beyond this webinar. So thank you all for being here. We'll open up for questions. Excellent. So we actually have a few that have come forward. I've been tracking those along the way. So happy to bring those forth to you. A couple of them that uh, did come up, um, especially one that I was asked a few times, um, do the families need legal status to qualify? Uh, not necessarily. So sometimes the challenge for undocumented families is the identification piece. Um, they do have to provide that at the beginning in, for them to be able to open an account with the USAC who manages the program. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, as long as that, as the adult, the, the household member um, is able to prove eligibility and, you know, if they can, forgive me, if they can prove identity and then if they have, for example, a um, student enrolled in a CEP school or receiving free or reduced lunch, they qualify for the benefit. Uh, excellent. And that was pretty evident there on that screen too. I think, you know, you said there that, um, you know, as long as they have that documentation from the school, what school it is, so that, that's great as well. Um, so those of you out as attendees do go on, explore that um, and uh, check out those um, options that need to be filled out to see how your team can support your families. All right, another question that came up. Uh, let's see, has been conversation around expanding language service um, resources, you said, um, and so specifically, um, how many languages are available? And there were some questions around Somali and Chinese as well. Yes, um, at this point, I believe we have uh, translations in 12 different languages. Okay. Uh, so it's very broad. I would have to double check. Um, but yes, uh, we have, through the work that we did in Worcester, um, a lot of, of you know, mm -hmm. need, there was a lot of need for translation. So a lot of that was, uh, was translated for them and is now available. Oh, fantastic. And, and, and I guess, you know, from a district perspective as well, if they do have families needing additional translations, um, do who do they contact? Do they contact you or do they have permission to actually get some translation done for them in a different language that might not be currently available? 
Yeah, I mean, if they if they have the capacity to translate it and you know customize it to to their use, uh, there is some capacity to do that. Um, if there is a particular language that we do not have, um, you know, materials for, I, I would be more than happy to bring it up to our team and work on getting that done for you. Um, it's important for us to uh, for the you know for the resources to be inclusive, and so languages is obviously one of those main keys to touch on. Oh, absolutely. And there was an additional question. Thank you, Michael, for putting that there in the chat. The question in regards to just kind of a just a refresher on where were those templates located specifically on the site? So within the toolkit, um, there are links that lead to a resource hub, which is what I, I shared um, during the presentation. So if you go to to the resource hub um, or click directly on the toolkit, it will directly it will direct you exactly to the to the place where you can download um, that resource. Okay, fantastic. And I just um, pasting that there, that was page five, the resource hub link is there. So I put that there again. Um, it says it's um, currently, it says it's only English and Spanish version it shows. So, um, so we can definitely, Michael, follow up with you. Um, and in that email, when we um, send out the recording and resources for this webinar, we can make sure and follow up with that too. I don't know, Marcella, if you have any other information on that um are you talking about the translation for the letters for the yeah template? he said he only saw english and spanish on the site currently yeah so <laughs> the challenge for us uh, is not to translate that piece the challenge is from the usac side uh, uh, they are only accepting documents in spanish and english at this point so that's okay. why that's the only two languages that we have translated the letter into um, the same applies for benefit letters that families are submitting. Um, they are only accepting English and Spanish. Okay, so so then it sounds like so they could translate the letter into the other languages, but those families that beyond Spanish and English will need to submit in English. Right, and the thing okay. to know, I guess, about the CEP letter is that the families themselves don't have to actually do anything to the letter. The information has to be put in mm -hmm. from the school end. Um, and so, you know, there's uh, other than notifying the the families in their language just through awareness mm -hmm. materials, they won't have to interact with that particular letter other than submitting it to USAC. Okay, great. So the um, other 12 languages you were talking about, those were some of the resource materials? Right. We have flyers translated in many different languages. Ah, great. So those are the flyers. Excellent. All righty. And let's see, any other questions coming up out there? Make sure and put them into the chat. We're I'm more than happy to address them. And let's see here. I have one on what kind of family support structures can schools implement to best help families access the ACP? What have you Great. noticed and heard from others? Great question. Um, so there are different methods of approaching it. And I think that is that depends on the structure that you have within your school. Uh, we have seen schools that have family liaisons. And so those, those people are the very well placed to bring that information into the household since they have direct contact with the families. Um, the other thing that we have seen is, uh, you know, the, the people who work in the, in the tech side of things within the school um, can be a good resource um, if you want to provide enrollment support and have families, you know, enroll online and navigate the whole um, application process. Um, so it really does depend on what structures you have um, within your schools. I hope that helps and answers the question. Yeah, it actually spurred some other questions that came up. So this is good. Um, so the question would be, is the ACP awareness video come in other languages besides English? We are translating a couple of resources. So we will be happy to share as soon as we do that. Okay, fantastic. And there are some, um, you know, Nathan, I'm glad you brought that up. There are some accessibility tools um, that uh, would help with some of that as well. If you do need that, we can, uh, I can give you a little tech tip later, but I'll move on for that, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, another one came here in the chat. I'm going to take a look here. Do you know if it has a lot of barriers to getting approved? So, and this, uh, it's Michael says, I know with Comcast program, they couldn't already have their cable service. Like you couldn't already have something established where a lot of hoops that families were having to jump through. So what are your thoughts on that? Any barriers that might occur? Um, so there are two different uh 
sets of barriers, right? Uh, there is the application part. Um, when I was talking about the CEP letters, those actually have to undergo a manual review. And so it's it's more of a you know onerous process to to get that mm -hmm. done. Um, in terms of accessibility and and having it be a quick um, certification, um, we have seen that people who apply via their social security number and a um, benefit program tend to be um, qualified a lot faster just because there is data sh sharing in the back end. And so, um, you know, sometimes they fill out the application and immediately get their code. And there's no waiting, um, you know, for for review. Um, in terms of other, there have been other instances in which, you know, depending on how people are verifying identity and how they are qualifying, it can be a longer process. Um, so people have to wait maybe a couple of days before they hear back from USAC. Um, in terms of the ISP end, there are some protections that were put in, in place to make sure that people had access to plans. Uh, for example, uh, you know, people are able to pretty much go to any ISP. They are, they, there is no requirement for a credit check, for example. Um, and if there is a debt associated with an existing account, um, they cannot deny service based on that. So, um, you know, the, the government, the federal government really wants to make sure that people are able to access the benefit. And so they have mm -hmm. made agreements with internet service providers to, um, you know, lower those barriers. Oh, but, fantastic. Yeah, but in terms of the uh, Comcast uh, question specifically, mm -hmm. I know they are, they are working on uh, figuring out a faster way to apply. They are, they, I believe, apply to be an alternate, alternate ver verifier. So it could become a one-stop shop. Uh, so people could go to sign up for the benefit on the con on the Xfinity website for, mm -hmm. you know, Internet Essentials or Internet Essentials Plus, and at the same time, fill out the application for ACP. And so, you know, it could become a very seamless process and then people won't have to deal so much with calling reps and being mm -hmm. told different uh, pieces of information that are not accurate. Oh, fantastic. Well, a great follow-up question came up as well. Uh, you know, a lot of families do move. And so the question is, do they need to apply again every time they move or will this transfer to their next home? Great question. It is. Um, yes. It's huge. <laughs> <laughs> no, so they are able to carry their benefit wherever they go. Um, all they have to do is log back into their national verifier account, update their address, and obviously not to notify their um, internet service provider about that move so that the benefit can transfer to that address. Oh, great. And then um, Michael uh, came back with another question here, and it says, it, on your site, is there a list of approved ISPs or does it depend on the local area? Yeah, a lot of the times it depends on the local area. Um, mm -hmm. For the most part, all major ISPs have a plan, at least one plan that is free with ACP. Um, for the more rural areas, um, there can be some challenges because a lot of the smaller ISPs are actually not participating in this um, benefit or in this program due to more logistical issues. Um, you know, there, there is some wait lagging period in which USAC mm -hmm. um, does not pay the benefit to these smaller ISPs. So, you know, just based um, on cash flows, I believe, um, uh, is the main driver for why they don't participate in the program. But for the most part, um, all major ISPs have at least one, one plan. Okay, so when they, um, follow up question. So when they apply and they put in their information, address, zip code, all that, are they presented back with an email that has options of different approved carriers um, yes. for them to take a look at? Yeah, so uh, the FCC will provide, or USAC um, in the, the verification email will provide a link for, you know, you, it says click here to identify a provider near you. Okay. Uh, so, you know, all the person has to do is put in their zip code and yeah. see what plants are available or what, what oh. providers are available in their area. Okay. Um, it's not always the most accurate information. So yeah. definitely call the uh, provider to verify that they are indeed providing service to that specific address. Um, but yes, there's ways to make sure that um, people have access to that information. 
Yeah, I'm just thinking back to um, when I was in the district, when I was a district leader, it, it might even behoove us to have a family come and join us and sit down and do it together so that we can learn a little bit more about the process too and get some feedback on supports as well. So that community connection will be a great idea out there in your districts to uh, reach out and see how you can be of support to get through those first few and then think about your next steps and how you might uh, support your community more. So absolutely. Let's see. I think I have a couple couple more. What is this? Sorry, I'm going to need to pause for just one second. Okay. Oh, and uh, more questions are coming through. This is great. Oh, okay. So how aware of this program are the ISPs? Did the ISPs um, have to get go to the government, ask for it, this and that, and take real part? So they're to be completely aware. So when people call their ISP, they aren't going to get kind of turned around in circles. Yeah, no. Um, I would say that pretty much all ISPs are on board. Um, the only issue that we encounter sometimes is that they have not trained their representatives uh, mm -hmm. enough to know all the rules about how to apply the benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, you know, pretty much at this point, every ISP uh, website, for example, has some information about the ACP. Uh, so mm -hmm. they are in it. Um, they A lot of partnerships with were created back in got to be uh, October, maybe a little earlier in the year, there was a White House press conference and a lot of um, ISPs participated in that. Um, so everybody came on board, designed new plans that could be free with it with a benefit. So yes, they, they are very much aware. Excellent. So any of them, are there dedicated phone numbers that people call or is it just specific to the ISP? Some of them have um, dedicated numbers, but most oh. of them you have to call the general number. Um, okay. And sometimes you can even uh, request the service via um, online. Oh, okay, excellent. And here's one that uh, we came up against in the pandemic for those of us taking our districts to remote and then back in person again. It's one thing that we found even a lot more about uh, was that not all families have email addresses. And the online applications are kind of scary for them. So I know we use some specific strategies for our families during pandemic for barriers, but have you heard of any or what are your suggestions and recommendations? Yeah, that is a big one. Um, yes. You know, for the most part, um, we encourage people to start using email. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's about creating that comfort and using, uh, you know, devices and, and engaging in that online world. Uh, but if they uh, do not choose to do that, um, you know, if they have a family member who mm -hmm. can provide that email address, uh, most communications will come via email. So, it, you know, make sure that if they do use somebody else's email address, it's something that they can have regular access to. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that is that is the extent of my advice for that. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, it's kind of one of those where, all right, we can do a query in our student information system, find out who don't have emails so that we can be prepared to support them, right? And mm -hmm. it's one of those, how, how, how do we, how do we not? But, you know, it sounds like a real nice opportunity as well for student ambassadors or student tech teams to get involved and maybe even do some outreach to families, um, maybe about ISP specific or just email awareness might be a really fun opportunity to connect with the school community as well. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. Any other ideas come along the way? Want to make sure and leverage as much of our time together today to meet your needs. So any last questions might have surfaced? I'll give you a moment just to think about that. And I don't know, Marcella, if anything else has come to mind as they're processing their final questions. Um, not much comes to mind at the moment. I, I would say, you know, again, if there is, if you do plan to engage in this work and, you know, want to talk it out, plan it out, you know, generally, um, our doors are always open. So, you know, feel free to reach out. I know, um, I believe you'll be sharing my email address. So, um, you know, it's, it's, still, it's open. All righty. So just a couple last things. Um, mm -hmm. One question did come up and, and they asked if there was a paper version of the application program or applying, or is it just online? So there is a paper version of the application. Um, however, 
um, there's no way to track it. Uh, okay. So we never know when it gets to use that. We never know, um, you know, how far in the mm -hmm. in the process it is. Um, so it just becomes a little bit more tricky to, you know, call and figure out what's what's holding it up. Mm -hmm. um, when you call after filling out a um, an online application, you're able to provide a couple of pieces of information and they can pull that account. But for with a paper application, that is not possible. Um, the other thing is that people will also have to print and enclose the documents that are required for them to um, be eligible. So it's one other step that needs to be taken for paper applications. Yeah, might be one of those things where you might fill out the paper application and then have a night where the families can come in and you, there you have some support network to help them input it online. And at least the yeah. information's there and it, it would be uh, accessible to them in both four ways as well. So. And let's see, oh, family can mail it in as an option. And that would be part of that uh, written one, that I would suspect, correct? Yes. Yeah, all right. Okay, well, any last questions? We're gonna start to wrap it up. If we could switch to that last slide, that would be fantastic. I'm just gonna give a little tidbit here as they are switching our slide deck to the last slide. And that's the contact information. All righty. One thing I want to just let you know is that you will be receiving an email with the recording as well as the slide deck too and the links that were shared today. So you'll have all the resources available to you to make sure that you have everything that you need to be successful. And just to get you started, I'm going to go ahead and put those resources back there into the chat. So go ahead and copy all those, but you will receive them in an email as well with that slide deck too. So share and share away. And always, Marcella is your contact as well as Jessica Schuler here on our Digital Promise team. And thank you so much, Marcella, for all your wealth of knowledge and sharing and, and case studies and everyone out there, the attendees as well. Great questions. And I know that your community is going to be so happy to have your support. So any final closing thoughts, Marcella, before we head out? Um, just want to plug that I just dropped in the chat the link to the paper application if people are interested in having access to that. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll make sure we add that in the email too. Um, so thank you everyone and great to have you here with us and have a great end to your week. And for me, it's still morning time. So for those of you on the East Coast, have a great afternoon. For those of us on the West, enjoy your lunch. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.